Good evening. Welcome to the, this IET Merseyside and Western Cheshire Local Network webinar. This webinar has been organised by the Local Networks Energy and Environment Group. I'm Rob MacDonald, I'm the chair of the group and I'm the host for this webinar. Next slide, please, Simon. The Merseyside and Western Cheshire Local Network is in the northwest of England and covers a large geographic area with a large engineering and technology base with some great universities and colleges. The map shows the local network area on the mainland and, and includes the Isle of Man, which is, of course, not on the map. Next slide, please. The IET Midside and Western Cheshire Local Network Group promotes engineering and technology in an important area of energy and environment subject area. The group organises webinars, face-to-face -face lectures and technical visits in our area. Next slide, please, Simon. Our next event, on Thursday the 17th of November, we have a face-to-face -face lecture event giving an overview of Rolls-Royce Small Modular Nuclear Reactor Power Stations. Alan Woods, Strategy and Business Director at Rolls-Royce SMR, will give the lecture. The event will be at the Engine, Room, Engine Rooms Conference Centre, Birchwood, Warrington. For more information on this free-to-attend event and to register, please visit the IET events web pages. Next slide, please. This evening's webinar will be given by Sam Wood, head of, uh, head of Network Infrastructure Projects at Zenobi, and his colleague Mike Struby, Senior Associate Engineer at Zenobi. Next slide, please, Sam. Simon and Mike will speak for about 40 to 50 minutes with a Q&A session after, after the, Simon's presentation. Please submit your questions via the Q&A box on the Zoom screen. If you would like to have a CPC, CPD certificate for this event, I will post the link in the chat box. The webinar will be recorded and will be posted on the IET Merseyside and Western Cheshire YouTube channel in about a week from now. I'd like to ask Simon to start his presentation. Over to you, Simon. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Robert, for that uh, introduction. So, yeah, absolutely. Pleasure to uh, to be speaking to you all this evening. Um, I'm joined by my colleague Mike, and we'll do some some more formal introductions shortly. But uh, yeah, we we're here this evening to essentially present to you a little bit about battery energy storage, um, about what that is, what it means, why we think it's it's really fun, really interesting, and important. Um, but most importantly, we want to just give you a bit of an insight into the Cape and Hurst battery energy storage project which is a, a, a site local to the, the Merseyside area that we've just recently finished construction of. So to go through just that high level agenda of what we're going to, to run through this evening, we'll do a bit of an introduction both, both to ourselves, but also to Zenobi as a business. I'm sure some of you probably, or most of you probably haven't heard of us, to be honest. And um, so we'll explain a little bit about who we are and, and what we do as a company. I uh, will then go into explaining more around some of the technical information about battery energy storage systems. So what are they, what do they do, and why are they so important? We'll then explain in detail uh, and do a bit more of a deep dive into the, the Cape and Hearst project, uh, explain a bit about what exactly that is, uh, why we've built that site, and, and why it's so important to the, the, the national infrastructure and a bit about you know how we'd go about building a site like that and what it takes to actually build and construct a large-scale battery energy storage system and finally we'll explain a little a little bit about what is next for the industry so not just for Zenobi but batteries as a whole how we can push those to the next level and start using um, that capability to provide new and exciting services to, to national grid and and beyond um, and we'll finish with, with just some Q&A. So, who are we? Well, yeah, as, um, as Robert said, my name is Simon Woods. I'm Head of Network Infrastructure Projects at Zenobi. So I look after essentially the, the, mainly the delivery phase of, of all of our large-scale grid-connected battery energy storage solutions. Uh, and Mike, I'll let you introduce yourself. Sure, thanks, Simon. So hi, I'm, I'm Mike Truby. And I'm a project engineer at Zenobi, so I work on supporting the sort of delivery of the battery energy storage solutions that Zenobi develops um, from an engineering point of view. Thanks, Mike. 
So who are Zenobi? Um, most of you probably haven't heard of us. We're a, a, still a fairly small company, although we have grown pretty rapidly over the last few years. But ultimately, our ambition as a company is to make clean power accessible to all. We're not a generator of renewable energy. We are a renewable energy company, but we see ourselves more as, as an enabler, a company that helps renewable energy generation make its way onto the network and onto the system, whilst also supporting the transition to net zero through transport solutions and clever second life applications of battery technology. The key being that we focus on batteries. Um, that's what we do. Batteries are our thing. And if we can use batteries to do something new and innovative that, that helps not just achieve the net zero goals that we're all trying to aim towards, but also make people's lives generally a little bit easier, that's that's where we, we, we excel. That's our expertise. So we finance, we design, we build, and we manage battery systems, uh, both across renewables, um, electric vehicle fleets, and also the sort of the second life market. And I'll explain a little bit more about those three pillars of the business shortly. So what, what do we, building on that, what, what do we do as, as a company? Um, so as I was just saying, we, we essentially split the business into three main pillars, three main work streams, if you like. Myself and Mike, we form part of the network infrastructure business, and that is purely looking at large scale grid connected battery energy storage solutions. So this is essentially a, a large battery system which connects onto the network and provides services to the distribution or the transmission operator. We also have a business unit that looks at electric vehicles and electrification of transport systems. So that's largely focused at the moment on bus fleets. Um, I think it's around 25% of the UK market that we currently hold. So any sort of bus, electric bus fleets that you see around the various cities in the UK, chances are at least one of those will, will be as an OB bus. Um, and we're also doing work, working with some commercial fleets, so you know, companies that have big, big commercial van fleets, for example, and seeing if we can help to electrify their, their fleets and their vehicles. And then we have a third uh, part of the company that is a little bit newer, um, but we're really excited about it, and that is Second Life Application. So that's looking at how we can actually use the batteries that we've previously used in either the network infrastructure or the fleet side of the business and repurpose those to make the most of their last remaining life. Um, with an electric vehicle, once the batteries get to around about an 80% state of health, they're not really any good for that application anymore. Um, but they're still very useful. Uh, they still have a lot of capability. And that's why we've started to create this new second life product where we can repackage and repurpose those batteries and use them for things such as temporary power generation, or uh, services to provide backup power. Um, and we'll explain a little bit more about that because it's, it's, quite, it's quite exciting actually. So a, a little bit more just general overview um, of the business. So yeah, as I said, we were very young. We were founded only in 2017, um, but we've grown now to, to I think over 140 staff um, and we've got loads of vacancies. So if, if anybody is, is on this and, and finds it interesting, um, what we're talking about, please do check out our website. We've, I think we've got about 40 vacancies open at the moment. So we are still looking to recruit and, and grow significantly. Um, as a result of that growth, we've managed to raise over 500 million um, in the business. So that's allowed us to sort of expand at, at a ra rapid rate. And that number will probably double over the next six months. And as I said, we've got the three sort of main pillars of the business in network infrastructure, EV fleets and Second Life. I'll focus mainly on network infrastructure because that's what we're talking about uh, to you this evening. And that's mine and, and Mike's um, speciality. And what we'll focus on this evening is Europe's largest battery site. And that's the one in Capenhurst that we've been, been building. 100 megawatts in size, uh, roughly 100 megawatt hours. So it's a one hour system. But we also have, you know, on top of that site, we have many others across the UK and a very exciting pipeline of projects, which will take us to in excess of a gigawatt of battery energy storage connected to the system by probably 2025, I think. Um, 
we're constantly looking to sort of break the barriers of what can be done with with battery technology um and that's why we're you know we are the world's first to provide a direct reactive power service contract to national grid and when we get towards the end of our presentation we're looking at what's next we'll explain a bit more about the exciting new projects that we have coming through and again why they're so innovative and uh and sort of leading the market in what we do so i won't dwell on this too much but it's just to give you the the idea of, sort of what zenobi is all about and how batteries fit into the overall energy mix the idea is that you know we're all working at the moment to achieve or target to achieve the net zero ambition it's plastered all over the news you some of you may have uh, followed cop 26 that happened in, in glasgow earlier this year but it's all about trying to get to that net zero position and for us we see that in a sort of circular fashion of providing an energy system that is sort of sustainable in its very nature um, and we think batteries are absolutely key to that um, the more renewables come onto the system the more batteries are going to be needed to help stabilize the network so batteries can be used right from the sort of the early generation of power through the actual uh, life cycle of that that plant or that asset we can help to reduce emissions directly not just through energy generation but also through you know vehicle applications and then it's it's through to the the reuse and recycle part of that that circle which is where our second life applications come into play this is just a, a very high level graphic to give you a flavor of sort of where where we operate we're not just a uk based company so we also have assets and operations in australia and new zealand um across Europe and next year we will be uh, opening up an office in in the US as well um, and the little graphic on the left there just shows you where some of our existing network infrastructure sites are and some of the uh, electric vehicle or, or bus fleets that we've provided over the the recent years so network infrastructure um that's that's the main thing we want to talk to you about and what exactly is that well our ultimate aim is helping grid operators and that's both district at a distribution level and a transmission level on the uk electricity system move to a full renewable electricity system affordably and reliably and those three points are really important to understand some of you may be familiar with the term of the energy trilemma uh, it's essentially the, the challenge that faces the energy industry um, of trying to get the balance between sustainability affordability and security of supply in relation to our our energy mix and it's it's never been so prominent as it is today i mean we, we all know about the the energy crisis that we're in uh, prices have gone through the roof largely as a result of a a lack of security of supply so trying to get that sweet spot between sustainability security of supply and affordability is very difficult and that's the challenge that we're trying to to all meet in our industry quite often you move towards one and you therefore offset against the other for example you know sustainability if we wanted to go straight to a renewable world it would not be very affordable to do so and we'd have issues with security of supply likewise if we want pure secure supply will fire up all the coal stations again but that's not very good for sustainability so we are trying to help manage that energy trilemma and that's where we think batteries play such an important role so our view is you know batteries are are used as a technology to help operators and, and generators overcome the challenges in balancing not only sort of supply but also demand on the system that's the beauty of batteries they can operate in both both modes um, but not only that we also provide services to the grid to help stabilize the network and manage constraints in the local areas so that's what we do we provide large-scale grid connected battery storage solutions and we provide the capabilities of these assets directly to the likes of national grid to help stabilize and balance the uk electricity network our sites are generally strategically placed around the uk to to specifically target and manage the areas that are most constrained or 
network points that have the most instability. And as a company, we generally originate, design, build, and then operate all of our sites. So we we literally start from the very beginning. We'll try and identify an area of the network that needs support in some way. We'll work with national grids to put the contracts in place to deliver a service. And then we'll actually develop and deliver that project ourselves um, before going on to obviously operate that asset for the remain, remainder of its life. So why why do we need these? And I've got the blame renewables. Obviously, it's a it's a bit of a flippant comment, but it, it is true. Ultimately, the reason why battery storage is becoming more and more important is because we're increasing the penetration of renewable energy onto our network, onto our electricity system. And that comes with challenges. It's an intermittent source. Generally, you think of, of wind and solar. So that needs a level of balancing. But also it's become decentralized. Our electricity system in the UK has gone from a, a backbone of large scale generators, big power, coal power stations and, and gas, um, gas CCGTs and, and the likes and nuclear sites. Yeah. And they're all coming offline. And what that means is, is the, the power generation is shifting in the UK. It's becoming more decentralized and it's becoming smaller. And it's becoming more re renewable based. I think we just broke the record actually it was yesterday for the most wind ever on the UK system of almost 21 gigawatts, which, which is amazing. But we've, as a result of that, we've lost a lot of system inertia. And Michael going to explain a bit more about what exactly that means. But essentially, our network is less stable. And batteries are a perfect technology to help that because of their fast response and their ability to manage both in a supply and demand nature. This is a little bit of a wordy slide, but it sort of summarizes all of that into, uh, into some pretty simplistic terms. Um, renewable energy is intermittent. The wind blows, the sun shines, we get, we get power, great. But what happens when that doesn't, um, or that isn't the case? And that means um, it's challenging for national grid because they have to permanently balance that supply on the system with the demand. Um, and that's what we can do with batteries. We, we help them provide that flexibility on the system. So they can offer us the ability to adjust supply and demand to help balance that system. Um, and that's known generally uh, as, as arbitrage. As, as people generally know it, that is the, the standard use case for a battery. You could charge the cells up when the wind is blowing or the sun is shining and uh, there is surplus electricity on the system. And then you can discharge that at times of peak demand. I go on to explain a little bit more about actually that's that's not the, the, the most useful case for batteries, albeit it's the most commonly understood. But actually where batteries really provide the most benefit is more around the stability management. Some of you may be aware of the concept of grid frequency. So our, our electricity system anywhere in the UK is generally operating at around 50 Hertz level. And if we go above or below that, we start to get an unstable network. And if we go too far above or too far below that 50 Hertz band, the system will start to protect itself and start tripping out. So for National Grid, it is absolutely imperative that the electricity network maintains around that 50 hertz frequency level. Batteries are brilliant because they can track frequency and respond to very small deviations in, in grid frequency by importing or exporting active power. And in doing that, it can basically help to stabilize the frequency of the network. But there's so much more that batteries can do. And I will, I will leave it to Mike to explain a bit more about what that, that looks like in terms of also reactive power and therefore voltage control and also clever services such as synthetic inertia and uh, so short circuit level. So moving into more of the, the technical elements of battery storage systems, at this point, I'll, I'll hand over to Mike and let him take you through a bit about actually the, the principles of what constitutes a battery storage system. Great, thanks very much, Simon. Um, so I felt like we couldn't really talk about battery energy storage without talking very briefly about batteries. So when we're talking about 
battery energy storage, static batteries. Currently, we're typically talking about lithium ion batteries. And so this graphic on the screen really just gives you a sort of a very high level overview of how they work. So in a lithium ion battery cell, you have a few key components. You've got a couple of terminals, a negative and a positive one. You've got an electrolyte that sits between them with some kind of separator between the two sides of the system. And then you'll have a circuit that connects around them. What happens when we discharge a battery in a lithium ion battery is that lithium ions, hence the name, move from the negative terminal to the positive terminal. And because we've got this accumulation of charge happening, what we see is that we also get a flow of electrons through the circuit to balance it out. And those are the electrons that are supplying our load. That's the energy that we're taking out and we're able to use to provide power. And we want to charge the system. We've got this potential difference across it. We're able to push the lithium ions the other way. They move from the positive to the negative uh, terminal and we have an opposite flow of electrons. Uh, and we need to put some energy into that system to provide those electrons to provide that impetus. And that's essentially the sort of basic principles of how a battery works. Um, so if we move on to the next slide, please, Simon. When we're talking about lithium ion, there's actually usually for, um, for energy storage anyway, and for most applications, two main types of battery chemistry that we're talking about. One of them is NMC, uh, nickel manganese cobalt. Uh, this is usually the most popular, the most common use uh, sort of type of battery at the moment. Um, and it's particularly popular in electric vehicle applications, and I'll come on to why in just a moment. And then we have LFP, which are lithium ion phosphorus batteries. Uh, at the moment, Zenobi almost exclusively uses uh, LFP batteries and there's a couple of reasons for that which I'll come on to on the next slide please. So I think the easiest thing to do when we're talking about these two main types of lithium ion batteries is to go over a few of the characteristics of them. And so the first thing that's worth mentioning is that there are some really important advantages to NMC batteries, particularly that lend them well to EV applications. Um, and that's the reason why historically uh, they have been the most popular. The first is that uh, LFP batteries are relatively sensitive to temperature. So you have to maintain the temperature around a, a much narrower operating sort of range. Uh, otherwise you start to see a little bit of a drop off of performance. It's not significant, but for regions Regions with sort of more extremes of climate, obviously it's something that factors in. NMC are less sensitive to temperature and therefore allow us to operate better at kind of at the edges of the normal range of environmental conditions. In addition to that, uh, NMC batteries from, from a chemical point of view have a higher energy density. And this is what means they are sort of so well suited to EV applications, because obviously we are spatially constrained and particularly in an electric vehicle, we are weight constrained and therefore having more electricity stored in a, in a smaller space, in a lighter space is better. And the other thing that lends them well to EV applications is typically they operate at a little bit of a higher voltage per cell. Uh, and this means Means that you get a bit more oomph out of them, which is really useful for starting an electric motor and running an electric motor. But having said that, LFP batteries, uh, we feel anyway, are much better suited to static operations. Um, the main reason for this is uh, around fire risk. So it's worth stating that battery fires are pretty rare. Um, but where battery fires do occur in lithium ion batteries, they're NMC fires. And the reason for that is that NMC batteries do have a property for thermal runaway if high temperatures aren't managed properly. LFP batteries do not have this property anywhere near to the same extent, and therefore they are much safer to manage. As I say, it is a relatively rare event that that happens, uh, but when it does happen, an LFP battery is much easier. Well, it doesn't happen in an LFP battery. The other side of that, the other part of that, is that means that for static applications in practice, the energy density actually starts to balance out because whilst you get more energy per cell in an NMC battery, you actually can pack LFC batteries much closer together. So when you're putting them onto an energy storage site, you could fit more batteries inside the building, inside your container, and it's easier to manage the temperatures that they generate. The other thing that is really beneficial around LFC, uh, LFP batteries for, um, for static applications, for uh, grid applications, is their operational lifespan. 
is a, is a much longer. So when we're talking about lifespan for batteries, we're talking about cycles, the number of times you can charge and discharge it. And NMC batteries typically nowadays will last for two to 3,000 cycles, some maybe longer, some maybe a little less. LFP batteries will last typically at least three times that long. There's actually a study on the screen here you can see, um, which was testing down to 80% sort of state of health, uh, the amount that a battery degrades over its life, because each time you cycle it, you lose a little bit of its charge and you can't get it back. Um, and you can see that an LFP battery just can perform many more cycles. For an electric vehicle, again, this is not so much of a problem because maybe you're only charging it a couple of times a week. But for grid connected batteries, you could be cycling them several times a day. And so it's really important to keep that cycle number up so that we get good 10, 15, 20 year lifespans out of these assets. And then the final thing that is worth mentioning um, in terms of LFP batteries is that they actually pose other sort of operational benefits in terms of safety, health and environment. Um, the first one being that because of materials that they're made of, the fact that they're more common, um, they pose sort of less of an environmental impact. Manufacturing them is greener because the materials that we're using are greener. And that's an important decision in renewables. And the second thing to sort of consider is that during those thermal runaway events um, that can happen in NMC batteries, because of the materials that they are used, uh, that you use to manufacture them, particularly the terminals, um, they can involve toxic gases, which does mean that there is additional safety management that is required for them. And so for all of those reasons, Sonobi uses LFP batteries as our battery of choice. Um, so next slide please, Sam. So I've talked a bit about the batteries, but battery energy storage obviously involves a lot of other components. Now, I'd love to be able to show you a line diagram for the Cape Penthurst site, but unfortunately I'll have to do that. So this, this graphic uh, really kind of gives you a sort of a nice overview of what is involved in a battery energy storage system. So on the right hand side of the screen, what you'll see is basically what you'd expect to find in any power station. We have this connection into a substation for Cape and Hurst. This is 275 kilovolts. And I'll talk in a little while about why that is. And because it's connected at 275 kilovolts, we then connect through a power transformer. We can't generate power from the batteries at that kind of voltage. And so we need some kind of step up transformer to connect it to the grid. We then have an MV distribution system um, on the site. We tend to generate power in the batteries or sort of charge discharge the batteries at a low voltage. Uh, we'll come on to how that works in just a moment. And then we transform it up to a medium voltage, typically 11 or 33 kV to distribute it around the site. We do that to manage losses basically. From there, we also have some kind of auxiliary distribution system. And this is basically to provide small power lighting and then like low voltage power to all of the applications that are needed to support the batteries. Management of the heating and cooling of the batteries, ventilation of the batteries, control systems for the site, telecommunication systems. Um, and in addition to that, the final and most important component of all of this is the actual battery modules themselves. When we talk about BESS, we're actually not just talking about batteries, but a kind of sort of number of devices connected together to allow those batteries to connect to the grid. So if I have the next slide, please, Simon. What a BESS module typically will constitute uh, is sort of four main components, really three or four components. So starting on the DC side of the system, we have the battery module itself. In a modern system, this is typically containerized. It might be in a sort of shipping container style unit. We also see smaller units as well that stack together, uh, DC coupled together in a modular fashion. This is essentially where all of our energy is stored uh, and we can call upon the batteries to charge or discharge real power in real time. We then have some kind of low voltage DC link into a power conversion system. This will typically be at around 1000 volts DC. Some are a little higher, some are a little lower. It depends on the system. The power conversion system is then one of the most critical parts of the whole system. So it's typically called a battery inverter. Now, I appreciate that in traditional systems, an inverter is a DC to AC conversion system, but a battery inverter must be, by definition, a bi-directional system. We have to be able to both charge and discharge. 
And what it will typically include is some kind of filtering circuit. What you can see on the left here is actually perhaps a little unusual. Uh, a DC to DC converter would normally only be used in an application where you have a variable DC voltage. So maybe where you DC couple the solar park to your battery at the DC level. It may be normally more of a simple system, but that will then pass through into some kind of switching circuit, as we've shown here. A H-bridge, again, a relatively simple switching circuit. And what this will do is it will use power electronics and some kind of methodology like pulse width modulation or space vector modulation to transform that DC current into an AC current. And the LVAC current that we're getting out will typically be in the region of 400 to 900 volts AC. Again, it depends on the system and some other system sort of limitations, including kind of current carrying capacity of that system. And that will then connect into a module transformer. And as I mentioned, the module transformer is there basically to transform that LVAC current into an MV current. And that is basically to minimize our losses around the plant because do you know as voltage goes up, current goes down, and therefore your resistive losses in the system go down as well. That transformer will then normally be connected into some kind of ring main unit. And what this allows us to do is to connect numerous battery modules together in either a radial or a ring topology uh, to connect into our MV switch gear. It means that we can isolate individual modules if we need to do maintenance on them, if there's a fault or we would like to replace part of it. Uh, and it also means that for systems that need higher redundancy, we can reconfigure our system in real time if there is a fault at the MV level. So next slide please, Sam. And I think I'll hand back over to yourself to talk a little bit about what that means in terms of grid services. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, I, we touched on this earlier, but it's just to sort of build off the back of having briefly now explained exactly, you know, what constitutes a battery energy storage system. It's just about understanding, you know, why exactly are these useful on the grid? You know, we mentioned that the typical use case is most people understand battery energy storage is that it stores it stores energy when there is a surplus amount on the system. So if we've got a very windy day, but a very sunny day, and actually we've got an overgeneration of power, we could essentially use batteries to store some of that energy. And that could then be released at a time where demand on the network is higher. And that's essentially the, the sort of peak shaving methodology, which is shown by that image on the right i mean that's that's at a macro level so that's looking at essentially the the uk wide load for for energy um or power the, what what batteries would do would be more on a local level on a more micro scale but the theory is the same um and that's known as energy arbitrage and yes ba batteries are used for that but typically it's it's not the most beneficial use case for a battery and that's where things like frequency services and reactive power capability is coming into play. Frequency being the most dominant. Um, over the last four or five years, since battery storage systems have been connecting into the grid, providing frequency services has been probably the, the most widely used and delivered service for a battery application. And that essentially, as I, I mentioned earlier, involves a, a system tracking grid frequency and responding accordingly by either exporting or importing power. And the reason it does that is to try and maintain that 50 hertz level on the network. There are other applications that we can start using now, and it's, it's really about maximizing what we can do with the inverter technology. And that's what Mike's gonna go on to explain in a little bit more detail, but ultimately, Batteries are useful, not just as a way to balance supply and demand, but as a stabilization mechanism for national grid or the distribution operators to be able to maintain the network. And that's become increasingly important in recent years as more renewables have come onto the system. We've got a more intermittent energy energy system and it's become decentralized. Um, you may, or some of you may be aware of the, the blackouts that we had a few years ago. That was an issue with grid frequency. I think it was a, a large wind farm and maybe a gas station um, that tripped, or I think the wind farm tripped first, and that subsequently caused 
the gas um, CCGT to trip. But ultimately what that meant is grid stability fell, dropped off a cliff, and you suddenly got a domino effect of assets tripping off and protection systems kicking in. And that's why we saw the blackouts. Ultimately, that was a system response to frequency falling and systems being shut down. So if we'd have had hundreds of megawatts of batteries connected on the system doing frequency response at that point in time, we might have been able to stop those blackouts. And that's the kind of thing that uh, battery storage technologies is looking to try and uh, support as we, we move to this newer energy mix. So with that, it leads us nicely into Capenhurst. Because what we have, have done at Zenobi is, is we've recently built a 100 megawatt site um, at a location just nearby Capenhurst uh, HV substation. It's a national grid substation connected directly into part of the transmission network. We'll explain a little bit about what, what exactly that site is and what that project's all about, why we've built it, why we've built it there in that specific location, and why it's an important asset to not just National Grid, but the, the whole sort of infrastructure of, of the UK electricity system. And we'll go through at sort of high level what exactly it takes to build uh, an asset of this nature. So to, to run through at high level, what is Capenhurst? Well, it's the biggest battery in Europe right now. These records are, are constantly getting broken. So this may stand true today. It would not surprise me if this will no longer be the case in a few months time. Um, we may even find that we, we break our own record because we are shortly about to start construction on a 200 megawatt site. It is connected directly onto 275 kV transmission uh, network. It is the only battery to have ever done that. So most batteries that have been delivered in the UK so far have been distribution connection. So they have been into 11 kV, 33 kV, or in some cases, 132 kV. So never before has a battery connected directly onto the 275 kV uh, network. We built this site off the back of being awarded a reactive power contract with National Grid. And as part of that contract, we are required to provide a service, which means we need to absorb a certain amount, that being 40 MVAR, of reactive power. And I'll leave it to Mike to go through the technicalities of exactly what that means. And just to give you a flavour of if you know how we'd go about delivering this, we generally split it into multiple contracts. So we don't operate on a full sort of turnkey EPC type basis. Some of you may be familiar with that term where basically we, we employ a single contractor to deliver everything regarding that project. We split the contracts up. So we'll have some supply contracts for some of the key components, such as the batteries and the inverters and the, the large step up transformers. And then we'll provide a balance of plant contractor with a wider role to piece it all together, essentially. So they'll do all of the ancillary um, equipment installation, all of the cabling works and civils on site. We also deliver these projects using a floor contract mechanism. So as part of our commercial proposition, as well as providing the, the reactive power service to National Grid, the beauty of batteries and battery uh, storage systems is that you can stack different revenue streams on top of each other. And this is where it starts to get very clever, essentially, and, and why batteries are so, um, so competitive in compared to some of the other more static um, systems and services that would generally provide a reactive power um, capability. So what you can do with batteries is whilst also providing a static reactive power service, you can also deliver frequency response, or you can provide a discharge of active power at the same time that you're absorbing reactive power. And again, Mike will go through a little bit about how that's possible and the reason why battery, uh, battery sites can deliver these kinds of technical capability. But the floor price that we, we set with 
um, our trading partner, who is uh, EDF, essentially means that they guarantee us a revenue profile month on month, and they will trade the, ba the battery how they best see fit and in, in the best market that they deem at that point in time. So if they want to deliver frequency response services, they can. If they would rather play in energy arbitrage, so that's just buying wholesale power at a certain price and selling it for what they hope is a slightly higher price, then they can do, but they guarantee us a flat revenue stream. Where we are with the site at the moment is we've built it. We're currently going through our commissioning process and we're hoping to wrap that up and concluded that within the next few weeks with the site entering full operations towards the end of this month. And as I was sort of building on there, this site will not only provide the reactive power service, which is sort of the most unique part of this asset, but it will provide the typical services that any other battery system would also do, such as dynamic containment, which is a frequency response market, uh, balancing mechanism, capacity market, and so on. Over to you, Mike. Oh, thanks, Alan. <clears throat> so I'll talk, talk a little bit more about that reactive power service, what it is, why it's needed, um, and, and how we achieve it. Um, so to start with, I appreciate a lot of people on the call will understand what reactive power is, but for the benefit of those who don't, our system primarily consists of real power. That is the power that is used to turn on your lights, turn on your computer, drive industrial machines. It's doing useful work. But there's another kind of power that exists within the system as well, the reactive power. And this is essentially the energy that we need to sacrifice in order to establish, maintain, and operate the electrical system. There's a lot of magnetic fields, electrical fields within that, in transformers, in generators, in motors, and even in the cables themselves. And we need this energy, basically, to be able to push power through the system. So the analogy that people use a lot is the pint of beer. Um, and what they say is that the beer is like the real power, and the head is like the reactive power. And for this service, I think it's useful to remember as well, is that the reason that you have that head on the beer is that you need that gas in the system to push pressure through the system and to make sure that that beer can flow. And a really important property of reactive power is that it's intrinsically linked to system voltage. And so if you have too much or too little reactive power in your system, uh, you find that your voltage starts to become unstable. And as Simon's already mentioned, it's really important for the stability and kind of the sort of um, survivability of the national network that voltage can be regulated. So in the traditional network, we had lots of synchronous machines uh, that produce and generate reactive power as part of what they do. Uh, they're very stable, they're very slow to change. And we also have a number of other devices that can be used to compensate reactive power. And the one that I'll particularly call attention to is shunt reactors, and I'll mention why in just a moment. But these are basically sited at nodes around the country and next to substations or key strategic locations uh, to try and balance that reactive power and therefore keep the voltage stable. And the really important thing to understand is the transmission system inherently, what it's doing with reactive power throughout the day is changing. As loads come on, on, on and offline, as industrial sites start up, as transformers change what they're doing, we are seeing that fluctuating and we're seeing that voltage fluctuating. And we need to be able to manage that as a network in real time. Uh, next slide, please, Sam. So, the Mersey region uh, actually specifically has had historically over the last 15 years a particular issue around high voltage and sort of reactive power imbalance. And particularly what they've been seeing is that the amount of reactive power on the system that needs absorbing has been rising disproportionately to the rate that can be absorbed. And so to try and manage this and to try and manage the high voltage issues that they were facing as a result of this, in 2019, the National Grid launched what they called the Mersey High Voltage Pathfinder, which was basically a competitive procurement exercise to get services from generators that could help to manage reactive power. So I've already mentioned there's a bunch of traditional equipment that can do that. And so a number of parties bid into this service. And there was a series of requirements for the service. The main ones that I want to call out um, was the fact that it was regional. So reactive power uh, affects the region around it most prominently and it affects the voltage of the region around it most prominently. And so being local to where the problem is, is really important. And that's a big part of why the Cape and Heist site is where it is. 
The second thing to mention is that the voltage also matters. So the higher voltage that you can take system actions with reactive power, the more impact that those actions will make. So the tender was open to connections at 33 kilovolts and above, uh, but the higher voltage you can connect and do something about it, the more impact you can make. And the final thing that's worth mentioning is that the response needs to be quick because as voltage starts to become unstable, you need to be able to manage that quickly. And so Zenobi was successful in winning one of two contracts awarded as part of this reactive power service. It was the first battery, um, I believe, in, in, in at least in Europe, if not the world, to win this service with National Grid. Um, and uh, the other contract went to a shun reactor, a traditional sort of mechanism for managing reactive power. And we'll come on to why in just a moment, but the benefit of a battery energy storage system is that a battery energy storage system, unlike a sort of ruption reactor or other stack calm or something else, is not just there for giving you, um, it's not just there for giving you the reactive power services, we can also provide other system actions that Simon's already described in terms of active power management, in terms of frequency response, in addition to that reactive power service. So it's multifunctional, and that means that it's better value for the customers of National Grid. Um, next slide, please, Simon. So I've talked a bit about what that reactive power service is, but I'd like to talk a little bit about how it actually works and what happens at Cape Coast. So as you've already mentioned, the battery energy storage system includes a number of inverters. We're talking in the region of 30 inverter modules for Capenhurst. And Capenhurst is contracted to provide 40 megabars of reactive power absorption from the transmission system. So the way an inverter works um, is that we have what you call quadrant control. And depending on what the inverter is designed to do, it can operate in one, two or four quadrants. And the quadrants basically describe how much real and reactive power the inverter is capable of injecting or absorbing from the system. Now, theoretically, an inverter can, that has four quadrant control, which is what the inverters at Cape and Hurst are, is capable of injecting 100% of the battery energy as real power or absorbing 100% of real power, or it can do it as reactive power. But in practice, there are limitations to what inverters can achieve. And what the graphic on the right here is trying to demonstrate is that historically, uh, inverters were somewhat limited in how much reactive power management they could provide. Modern inverters have become much, much more efficient and much better at handling the kind of extremes of operation. And so the system that we have installed at Capenhurst, which is similar to other systems on the market, I will sort of stress that whilst um, Capenhurst is unique in delivering this service first, this is not unique to necessarily to just the Capenhurst battery storage system. Um, we're able to push those limits closer and closer to that theoretical um, operating capability. And what that means is that the Cape and Hurst system can provide those 40 MVARs of reactive power absorption whilst still providing active power. And we can do that at 100%, 100 megawatts of active power trading. So we can be injecting active power into the grid to meet demand as we see the frequency fall or as we see that there is a peak at the same time as absorbing that reactive power. There are some other additional practical considerations you need to consider when you're designing for reactive power. And a really big one is that supergrid transformer I mentioned before. So Capenhurst being connected at 275 kV um, is connected at that voltage, as we said, because it has a much higher impact on the reactive power service. It also means we need that supergrid transformer. And transformers have big magnetic fields, which means therefore that they have a relatively big impact on reactive power. And so if we could have the next slide, please, Simon. What this means um, for Capenhurst is that we need to consider that reactive power in the control of the system. And so Zenobi has developed a proprietary control system with the delivery partners that we've worked on for this project um, that uses sort of in-house logic to manage the real and reactive power in real time, compensating for what that transformer is doing. And what this graphic on the screen shows now, this graph, this is actually kind of, uh, this has been taken directly from the grid compliance study that was conducted for us for the Cape and Hurst site. And the line in blue shows you what grid code requires you to operate at in terms of sort of that reactive power performance with voltage. The line in red shows you what the Cape and Hurst system is capable of operating at. 
And the area in that sort of yellow orange color is what the Cape and her system is capable of operating at in terms of reactive power absorption beyond what is required by the, the, um, by the Mersey Pathfinder contract that we won. And a large part of that is the fact that the uh, Zenobi control system is capable of instructing those inverters in conjunction with monitoring what the rest of that plan is doing and capable of doing. And so I think the final thing that I wanted to mention on this really is that what that means from a customer point of view and from a system user point of view is that battery energy storage is capable of delivering additional value to the network because rather than just buying a sort of a shunt reactor or a statcom or whatever it might be which is delivering that one service and don't get me wrong delivering it very well we are able to deliver multiple services out of a single asset um, and with that I'll hand back over to you please Tom. Thanks again, Mike. Um, so putting that theory into practice, now I'll skip through these slides pretty quickly. They're very picture heavy, so it'll save me do a lot of the talking and I'm also conscious of time. But essentially what we wanted to do is just give you a bit of an idea of essentially what Capenhurst looks like. So we've talked about the asset, we've talked about what it does and why it's important and the theory behind how a site like this operates. But actually, what does a battery site look like and how do we build it um so this is some high level facts and figures so what constitutes a battery energy storage well we've all we've already mentioned the connection and the capacity but this site we use byd battery containers so they're the containers in green on the screen there and they are packed full of battery modules. So a module consists of the individual cells packaged into a rectangular module. And they are then positioned in racks and arrays. And they're all connected up, linked together with DC bus bars, and then controlled through a central BMS battery management system. And each of those containers not only contains the battery cells and the modules, but it also has all the ancillary equipment. So HVAC systems, fire detection systems, all of the control systems that we've we've mentioned. So they're a fairly self-contained unit. I'd love to show you a picture of inside one of these containers, but unfortunately I, we're not allowed. Um, but yeah, it, there's, a, there's a lot going on in there and we, we get these pre-assembled and that's what allows us to build these sites in such, such a short amount of time. It's very modular in nature. The white, um, containers that you can see there are actually a, a skid a package system we refer to these as the mv skids and they basically house the inverters that mike was just talking about so there's five inverters on one of those those white skids it also includes the transformer that steps the voltage up in this instance from 400 uh, volts to 33 kv and then there's the rmu the ring main unit which forms the point of isolation and connects all of the MV skids together for that circuit. Mike's already mentioned the transformer. Um, obviously, linking all of this together is a significant amount of cabling, um, both DC cabling, 33 kV cabling, all of the LV cabling across the whole site. And then from the HV connection on the upstream side of the transformer, we then have a, about a 350 meter run of 275 kV cable where we connect directly into the substation, which is uh, next door. In fact, you can just see the top left there, some of the infrastructure of Cape and Hurst substation. So we started to build uh, the site in June last year. And this, this picture was taken in, in summer. Um, so at that point, it had taken us just, just over nine months to get to this stage. There was then a lot of the final work to do in terms of commissioning, energizing the site, finishing off a lot of the construction. And then we enter the commissioning phase where because of the complexities around how we're delivering multiple services and the uniqueness of the control system, the commissioning period is sort of improportionally large to the construction period as a result of that. The next few slides just give you essentially a timeline of events of, of how we've gone from a field, um, essentially, to, to the site that I just showed you. Um, a lot of civils works to begin with, um, early ground works to level the site, and then formation of all of the foundations required, both for the battery uh, containers, the MV skids, uh, switch gear, control rooms, and so on, and the, 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 the supergrid transformer. 
and you can see the sense of scale there just as to how significant that uh, foundation needs to be for the size of that transformer. So as we progress from foundations, uh, we start to actually install some of the, the infrastructure required to connect everything. So we're installing the earth grid around the site. Um, we also do all the trenching, installing cable ducts, ready to pull all of the cables through and connect everything together. Um, and then we start to get into the nice part, starting to do the finishing touches and getting ready for equipment to be delivered and cables to be pulled into place. These images show a couple of things. We've got the main transformer being delivered and lifted into place. This is the main tank of the, the transformer itself. The ancillary parts are then assembled on site um, before that's then connected all together to, to the rest of the HV infrastructure. This shows all of the cable containment going in across the site. Obviously this, this is now all hidden by the containers. So what you can't see from that first picture is a plethora of containment and cabling that's required to connect all of the different containers and equipment together. And then we have these uh, pre-assembled control buildings, which house both the LV switch gear and the MV switch gear, all of the control systems, the protection uh, systems that we have in place, metering, all of the ancillary equipment required to form the power system and the power station sits within these modular buildings. A couple of images there showing some of the containers being lifted into position. Um, at the bottom there, you can see some of the final assembly work being done on the 33 kV side of the transformer. And then you've got the main bushings and bus bars connecting onto the 275 kV side of, of that transformer there. Um, here you can see some of the DC cabling that comes down and loops across from the battery containers up into the inverters. Um, which are, are next door to each other. Some more general pictures across the site. This is inside one of the MV control rooms. So this is the, the switch gear. This is essentially all 33 kV uh, circuit breakers here. So all of our points of isolation, uh, protection systems and control mechanisms. Um, and that's housed. This is basically inside that modular building that I uh, showed on the previous slide. Um, and then a couple more sort of through the site to give you a sense of scale of how many of these modules we have connected together. I think the site is roughly about uh, 150 metres long by about 50 or 60 metres wide. So that's sort of roughly the area that we're working to for a 100 megawatt system. And there's a couple of images showing in, in its almost finest uh, finished form, sorry. Um, this. I think these were taken during the summer, so things have progressed slightly since this point. But you can see there the sort of the scale in terms of how many of these containers we need to connect to get to 100 megawatts. Um, I like this image actually because it it shows you the, the sense of scale, but it's also you know nice having the the big um, pile in the background there and, and showing how directly this this asset links into that system ultimately. Okay, so what's next? Um, what else can we do with batteries? What's next for Zenobi? And how do we essentially keep innovating and pushing battery technology to its, its maximum capability? Well, early this year, we were successful in what is known as the Stability Phase 2 Pathfinder. And like with the Mersey Pathfinder, where we run a reactive power contract, this was a tender opened by National Grid to provide new stability services across the Scotland region, areas that are particularly constrained and areas of the network where they required an increase in short circuit level and system inertia. So going back to what we were talking about right at the start, where a decentralized generation system has resulted in a loss of inertia, we've gone from lots of big spinning mass, if you think of all your, your large turbine type generators, so coal, nuclear, gas, they're all built around synchronous machines, big spinning mass with lots of inertia. A lot of that's gone and the system therefore is far less stable. So national grids, in order to increase the stability, are looking for ways in which to basically award services and contracts to customers to be able to provide that stability. 
Now, historically, this kind of service would be done using other forms of synchronous machines, synchronous uh, condensers and, and that kind of thing. Never before had it been done or has it been done with batteries. Batteries aren't synchronous in any way. They don't have natural inertia. So that's where the, I guess, the, the, the importance of inverter technology comes into play. And Michael brief, briefly explain what that means. But we've been able to basically demonstrate through technical studies to National Grid that actually you can provide these service with, services with batteries. And uh, this is how you do it. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Simon. You say there's sort of three main services that as we move forwards, batteries are going to be able, well, batteries can provide. And the next generation of battery energy storage sites will start to provide in the UK. The first of them is this inertia service. So as Simon says, inertia is the ability of the system to resist change. And synchronous generators, because they're basically large pieces of metal spinning around, they're like flywheels, have inertia. But within electrical engineering, we also have this concept of synthetic inertia. And that's the ability of equipment to inject power, inject current into the system in response to um, system transients that is independent of what is happening to the frequency at the connection voltage or the connection terminals of that system. I can't go into the, the details too much now, unfortunately, because of time. But basically what this means for battery energy storage is uh, that inverters, whilst inverters themselves have no inertia, basically, they're power electronics, they switch instantaneously, they respond instantaneously, we can mimic what a synchronous machine is doing using an inverter with a dispatchable asset, i.e. a battery, behind it. So we can call on those batteries and say, this is the amount of power that we need to top up into the network in this profile to mimic what a synchronous machine would be doing right now to basically deaden this transient. And that is something that we have demonstrated through system studies, and that is something that we will de be deploying, as Simon says, in our next phase of large-scale projects. The other thing that batteries can do is provide a short circuit level. So basically, in a fault event, what happens is all of the current in your system rushes to the fault. And as a result of that, much like with the reactive power service we talked about before, your voltage starts to change. And specifically what happens is your voltage starts to collapse. All of your energy is leaving your system through this fault, and so your voltage goes down. What batteries can do very quickly is inject very large amounts of reactive power um, in a way to basically prop up that voltage. So it's a natural response of the inverters almost. They will inject these large reactive currents, capacitive currents basically, into the network, and that will prevent voltage collapse on the system and allow the protection systems on the network time to isolate the fault and protect the rest of the network and prevent a brownout or a blackout around it. The final thing that we can also start to do uh, as inverter technology specifically improves is Blackstar. So traditionally, uh, best inverters, battery inverters are what they call grid following. And actually in response to one of the questions that I saw come up, uh, the Capenhurst site is a grid following site, which means that you are measuring what is happening at the network and then you are responding to it. But the newest generation of inverters uh, are now capable of what they call grid forming. So rather than measuring the system voltage and frequency, we're able to generate internal references. And essentially, rather than following the synchronicity of the system, we're able to set it. And this means that for this generation of battery assets onwards, we will be able to deploy systems that can provide black start to the network without the need for black start generators. These batteries will be capable of doing black start. Now, this technology is really quite new. We're talking the last couple of years is all sort of started team development and deployment, but very quickly we will see the best sort of portfolio on the grid start to move towards this grid forming system. And I think that's really my uh, sort of wrap, wrap, wrap up, Simon. So I'll hand over to you to uh, to close out. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, I think I think that's us in terms of slides. Um, I'm conscious we've we've we have overrun slightly, so apologies for that. Um, we've gone through a lot though. We've we've covered a hell of a lot, and I appreciate it. it's it's a lot to try and take in. If anyone is interested in finding out more, 
it, we're, we're happy to, to give our, our details. We can certainly have a, a chat and try and answer some of your questions now. And if there's any we can't, we, we can try and respond to that afterwards. Um, it's also worth checking out our website. There's loads of information on there, case studies, um, more examples of the kind of things we're doing. And like I said at the start, if anybody is uh, interested in, in opportunities or vacancies, we have lots of openings at the moment as well. So yeah, please do check us out. Um, yeah, we're doing quite a lot of interesting stuff. Well, yeah. well, Simon and Mike, that was a tour de force, wasn't it, really? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that's a, a great, uh, you know, a, a great talk. Really, uh, it's been been a really, really good thing. So we've got we've got plenty of questions here. I actually like the black start question. Uh, I saw that question about halfway down the list, and then I saw, you know, uh, is Mike came in and answered it. Is, is Capenhurst a black star facility? The answer is no, it's not. Will future ones will be? Yes, they will. So what should we do? Can you, you can see the questions, gentlemen. Do you want to look down the questions and see what you'd like to answer? So I'll, I'll read some out and we'll, 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 uh, I'll go to the top because it was a long time ago. Um, first question, as a planning engineer working for a DNO, we're always concerned about the power ramp rate in megawatt seconds. Can this problem to be changed or, or set to a specific figure on site instead of the default program performance, which is normally 20 megawatts a second? Yeah, sure. So I'm happy to, to answer that. So one of the inherent advantages of batteries as a technology um, is, that, as I say, they are dispatchable um, and they respond very quickly, um, much quicker than a lot of conventional systems. Um, and one of the things that you can do within the site controllers is you can define the ramp rate. So I think as um, sort of we saw in some of the earlier slides, that can be in response to certain services. For example, we can respond to um, to respond to frequency services, but also in terms of start up and slow down. And there certain things that we obviously would like to consider internally for our plan, things like the stepping of the transformer tap changer, and there will also be certain external factors such as what the, what the network can handle locally. And what we're seeing, I think, as we move towards those new services, those, those black start and those uh, inertia services, is that those ramp rates will be, will be pushed higher and higher in theory. Uh, so batteries are capable of very, very fast responses now, um, and we can define what they should be uh, sort of for the service and for the connection. Well, thank you for that. Ne ne next question, which is I think is it, one is a, a good question for about batteries. Um, do you consider the environmental cost in manufacturing the bat batteries, including the raw materials? So that's quite a, quite a good topic for batteries in general, isn't it? So any comments on those uh, environmental issues of battery manufacture? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's no doubt it's probably one of the biggest questions that get, gets asked of our industry um, uh, and the queries around sort of the, the environmental and sustainability factors regarding you know, the mining of more raw materials and the finite resources that are used within batteries. The answer is yes, absolutely. We do consider that. I mean, I think Mike touched on it in, in one of his slides when he was comparing the different chemistries. And yes, there's, there's technical benefits to, to different chemistries. But one of the things that we actually consider as well is actually the environmental impact of that battery um, and the materials used to create that chemistry versus another. So it, it's undoubtedly something that we are very focused on. It's the whole reason, essentially, why we formed this second life stream of the company. And that's to, to try and make sure that we are as sustainable as possible with the batteries that we're using in our systems. So if, if we can reuse those and repurpose those at the end of the life, and extract the most use out of them, then that's you know by far the most beneficial way to do it. Uh, I know both both Tesla and Nissan are working on this thing where when the when the batteries are no longer fit for use in a car, they bolt on the side of your house and have, have a useful life beyond yes being being a, a car battery. Um, Tesla have been doing that for a while. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, no, yeah, absolutely, yeah. It's 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 a huge factor. It's it's something that's very sort of pressing in our industry at the moment and uh, something we, we definitely take a lot of focus on. So I'm just going to switch down. There's a question here, which I don't will answer, but maybe a topic for another day, which is a comparison about diesel versus battery busters. Now, we touched on what Zenobi do beyond what we've talked about tonight, the, 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 the 100 megawatt battery and uh, sort of battery buses versus diesel buses and, and other things and also the second use batteries, but that's maybe a topic for another night that rather than uh, what the heart's this one. 
Um, absolutely. No. It's, it's worth just, just on that point, actually, I, I think that there may even be a direct comparison on our website uh, regarding okay. diesel buses versus electric buses. It's, it's certainly a parameter that we, we do track one of many and i'm pretty sure on our website there is some stats about you know comparing the two yeah I, I believe off the top of my head it's something like the average bus uses the same amount of energy roughly as something um it's like 100 households or something so there is quite a significant saving that can be can be made and that the sort of mission statement of the zenobi ev business is to make air quality better in cities and i think that's a really important part of it as well considering the amount of emissions that are coming out of all that, that public transport all those vehicles and the fact that we can take that out of densely populated areas um, so i think that's a really important part to consider as well there's a very interesting question here, which I, I, I'm going to read this question out because I don't understand it. It's beyond my technical capability, but it sounds like a really good question. As renewables go over 50% of demand, either arbitrage has to increase or renewable capacity will have to overscale. So the demands can still be met on still cloudless days. In Germany, it's understood that there'll be very poor wind solar for two weeks, implying some terrible hours of arbitrage arbitrage could be necessary so this is i went to a lecture a few years ago and it the first slide was just had a date and a time on us and it was a uh, day in january at six o'clock in the evening when there was no sun and there was no wind and you wouldn't be surprised though no, that was a that was a lecture given by somebody from the nuclear industry um uh, so any comments on that it's, it's a clever question to me yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll give a stab first. So you're right, uh, essentially. So yeah, in order to, to move to a fully renewable based system, there needs to be either a way of managing those those lows. And that's that's why batteries are so important. I mean, you look at so National Grid have done tons of research into this. In fact, every year they release a new paper, which is their sort of energy outlook for the UK. And the amount of battery storage that they're forecasting um, that that is required on the network in order to get us to the level of renewables needed to to reach the targets that we're setting uh, you know, gigawatts I, I can't remember the exact figure but it's it is tens of gigawatts of, of battery energy storage or some form of energy storage um so yes absolutely the scale up required is is huge and uh that's exactly this the role that we're hoping to play in in this whole process you know we're looking at the moment renewables are bolstered by fast reserve power plants and quite often they are carbon formed sources of power whether that be gas or diesel in some cases or or even coal you know national grid are bringing back some of the coal plants this winter um, in order to manage the uh, the demand on the system so there's a huge amount of work to be done um, renewables still have a long way to go in terms of increasing their penetration but the only way that can be managed is by increasing energy storage on the system. And at the moment, the most efficient and effective way of doing that is still with batteries. Um, there's a good question here, which, which is a good electrical engineering question. What's the average power loss when introducing a BESS system? I will do, do another question. Is a, does the BESS produce a pure sine wave? Sine wave? So what, what's the, you know, you're taking power in, you're storing it, you're giving power out, you've got all this power electronics. So what, what, what's the efficiency? Yeah, sure. So um, it, it depends on the it depends on the system you install. Um, typically for an energy storage system like a battery, you'd be looking at around trip efficiency in the, in the region of 80%. Um, it depends on where you are in the life cycle. It's higher at the beginning of life. Uh, and it can be, depending on the system you buy, slightly lower at the at the end of life as well. Um, and it depends on really what you're doing with it while, while it's uh, being used as well. Um, but yeah, around that 80% mark is, is typical, I would say. Um, in terms of the uh, question about sine wave, it's power electronics. So it, it's always an approximation of an AC system. Um, but what I would say, it's a very good approximation in the same way that a solar plant or a wind farm is a very good approximation. Um, and as technology improves, it becomes a better and better approximation. I think, I think that's a function from my background as the inverter technology has got smarter and smarter over the decades, it's 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 become more and more a, a, like a true sine wave, doesn't it? And this, it, it can't be a true sine wave. It's DC switching in the end, just at different frequencies. 
The good critic is for Egypt. I think this is an interesting question. Um, well, well, in, in Egypt, where we have a wide, very wide areas of new areas in the desert with the new reclamation projects, the main challenge is power. Most use hydride systems with solar, PV systems and diesel generators. We've never thought about batteries due to high cost of replacements and required investment being too high. Is BESS able to solve this? That's an interesting one from the, the deserts of Egypt. You think that's a, a possibility? There's, there's, there's no reason why not. I mean, we're starting to see more and more use cases globally for, for batteries, not, not just as sort of fast response plants, but also as, as longer term solutions for backup power, essentially. Um, historically, battery systems have been shorter in duration, but we're seeing more and more that the longer duration systems are becoming more valuable. So we're going from you know typically one hour systems, which is, is what Cape and Hurst is sized for, to two, in some cases, three hour systems. Um, in the US, for example, this, the norm is, is often four hour systems because that's where they get their most value from. They have, you know, if we look at like the state of California, really high penetration of solar, which is great, but obviously that is limited through, through evening peaks and so on. Therefore that longer duration storage is, is much better used as a sort of backup power system for that longer peak shaving mechanism. So yes, absolutely. Um, there's no reason why batteries couldn't start to play a, a more pivotal role in, in those kinds of uh, situations as well. I so I think, oh, sorry, I just uh, one point to add to that, I think, which is uh, just for, for interest really, is that what you tend to find regionally is that um, there is a strong argument in certain regions for co-located storage with generation and in other regions you see that it's more separate. The UK we tend to have separated systems because the, the highest value actions for things like batteries as Simon said earlier are those system actions, those management actions for the, the grid network but in regions where renewables are really reliable uh, and you know, a good example is places where it is very sunny a good number of days of the year uh, then co-located storage starts to make a lot more sense as well and Therefore, I think that that's um, certainly what you tend to see in that trend. And as Simon says, places like California, we are seeing that trend already, that co-located storage is coming along with those renewables, particularly with solar power. There's, a, there's, there's two questions here from, well, three questions here from Ian Naylor, but I'm going to glue them all together as one because for electrical engineers, it's a sort of key, um, key issues. Within these prefabricated substations, how are you managing pressure relief? So, you know, if something goes madly wrong, how you manage the, uh, the, 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 the flash. Uh, do you have fire suppression systems in them, which is interesting with batteries, of valley burn, and also uh, maintenance inspections. How, you, how do you test, validate that the system is still safe? So it's, it's all in the HSE operational sort of area. Uh, any comments on those things? Sure, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll try and tackle those and then Mike can jump in as well. So in terms of the, the point around pressure relief, yes. Um, so in, in the MV control rooms where we have the, the 33 kV switch gear, pressure relief vents are, are in place there. So if there is some sort of arc event, then absolutely that would be basically um, pulled out of, uh, I think it's through the, the floor actually on, on the substation, but there's a, yeah, a pressure relief device that allows that to be um, safely de-energized. And for each battery module, they also have um, deflagration panels, which essentially are also you know, pressure relief vents. So if there is a buildup of pressure as a result of a, a fire or an issue within the battery container itself, then yes, that, that pressure is, is relieved. Leading on from that, in terms of fire suppression, this this is you know a very common question that we get as well about you know the, the the potential risks and fire risks of batteries. They're inherently quite safe. I know the media often you see a lot of Teslas on fire and and stuff like that. I mean, going back to Mike's presentation, a lot of the EV fires um, they do centre around NMC batteries, which are inherently more unstable and, and more prone to fires. In terms of what we do to, to try and mitigate any potential fires on, on any of our assets, um, there's a number of different layers of protection. There's obviously the first one being the sort of low level 
system um, protection, essentially. So as soon as any cell temperatures start to rise or there's an increase in a certain gas within the cell, then the control system would automatically shut off that module. Um, so that would be the first line of protection. There's then, you know, standard fire detection and suppression system. So each battery container has its own independent detection and suppression device. So if a fire is detected, albeit very unlikely, there is a gaseous suppression system that would activate to suppress the fire within that container. Failing that, um, the fire, the fire um, sorry, the container itself is fire rated. So that has a two hour fire rating. So that limits basically the um, exposure of that container and the potential for propagation to the, the next container or the next piece of equipment. Um, and it gives enough time for the emergency services to be able to respond and extinguish the fire with a typical water-based system. Um, that is still, you know, in order to properly extinguish a lithium battery fire, the only way you can really do that is through water. Um, so the site would be tripped, the, the site would be isolated and the fire would be extinguished. But the theory being is it would be limited to a single container and the risk to the rest of the site and therefore personnel would be extremely low. Um, and finally, maintenance, inspection and testing. So it is an unmanned site. Most battery sites are. They are completely unmanned. They are monitored remotely and we have a 24-7 control desk that monitors and, and operates the site uh, on a 24-7 basis. But we do send a team to site on at least a, a one-month basis and they will inspect all of the battery containers. They will do checks to make sure that there's no obvious settings or parameters that have, have been breached. Um, but generally, batteries are pretty low maintenance, to be honest. It's the beauty of them. Um, once a battery is installed, you can monitor the, the parameters, making sure that you know, there's no imbalance in the cells, that you know, for whatever reason, voltage levels are, are not too high or too low, or same with temperature. But generally, they run for the, their operational life. You know, in, in the case of Cape and Earth, that's 15 years. And at some point, you might have to swap out a module here or there. But generally, um, it's a pretty low maintenance piece of kit. And uh, yeah, that, that makes it even more attractive. I think uh, I've got to it, 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 I'll pick a question here because there's, there's more questions that we're going to answer tonight, friends. Uh, <laughs> Because if we stay on till midnight, we'll be okay. We'll do them all, but we're not going to do that. But it's just it's just because it actually is from my background. Uh, do you have any liability data to share on your battery installations? I'm interested in a, a thousand kVA application for coal size, and that's the control of major hazard installations. Yeah, uh, that can um, but it can not apply without a difference of mean time between fairly and relevant data. I used to be the engineering manager for a, a high hazard chemical plant. And this is um, stability of the network and how you control it is, is a quite a key issue. Uh, but you will get asked by the health and safety executive to provide all the data that what you're proposing will actually work. It's a bit of a, a, bit of a niche application, but it's an important application. Uh, so you, you might get a phone call from somebody from a uh, coma site. Um, very interesting <laughs> yeah, question. I, that. I, I mean, just, just to answer that one, for, for us as a business, da data is one of the most important things that we get from these sites because they're, you know, they're, they're generally unmanned. Um, the way we monitor these assets is through data. So we have a very large data analytics team that is focused on extracting every possible parameter and data points that we can from the site to best understand how the batteries are performing and there's there's a whole host of reasons why we do that one being sort of reliability and understanding you know how available we can make the asset because these assets work best when they're available like like every system connected and and, and working on the network and therefore, for, for us, we need to be targeting, you know, 99% plus availability. So reliability in that sense is absolutely key. Um, but also there's, you know, there's a lot to do with degradation and warranty of battery cells. And we monitor that very closely, understanding how we are using the battery in what sort of cyclic fashion and how that impacts the degradation of the cell over time. 
Um, so that, yeah, absolutely. This, I'm sure our team would have something we could share. If not, there's lots of sort of industry-wide research that's being done into this. Um, it's an interesting topic for certain installations. Um, you know, uh, just that ride through that 10 seconds or even, even a few cycles on the main is quite critical at times. Um, so that's just a bit of a nerdy one for me, really. Um, I think we, I think now we've been talking for close on an hour and a half, and I think that's enough. I think it's been a really great webinar. I see a few posts about the CPD certificates. And if you look in the chat, right at the beginning, I've, I, I, I've posted a, a link to where you can get your CPD certificates. The plan is to, we've recorded this webinar, and hopefully in a few days' time, uh, that will appear on our YouTube channel. Um, I recognise some of the, the names from previous uh, webinars, so you've done that before. And I would just think the time to say so thank you to Mike and Simon. It's been a fantastic webinar. It's, it's been a tour de force, and mm -hmm. uh, I think a great double act. Uh, you know, so thank you very much. So I think I'm going to close that now, if you don't mind, friends. So uh, I'm going to end the webinar. Thank, thank you. Very good much. evening. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much.